in the uh, owl's nest headquarters of uh, Head of Zeus. Um, and uh, I'm Nick Cheatham, and I am David Gilman's biggest fan. Um, David um, was one of, in fact, I think the first author um, uh, that we brought on board um, at Head of Zeus. Um, and uh, I was entranced um, by uh, his opening line um, in Master of War. Fate, with its travelling companions, bad luck and misery, arrived at Thomas Blackstone's door on a chilly, misladen morning, St William's Day, 1346. Those were the three lines that have basically now metamorphosed into five books in the Master of War series. Uh, and David has now written a standalone, uh, which we will be publishing uh, in August, which leaps forward 500 years from the Hundred Years' War in France to the Second World War in France. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Mm. So David, my first question is, what prompted your jump forward for 500 years from uh, the Hundred Years' War into uh, the Second World War? Well, it was another period of history that, that I find very interesting. and. Whereas I have been using a young man in the medieval series, the Master of War series, and he grows into being the knight and the warrior that he is, I wanted to take it from the other end, as it were, and here's a man who's in his 40s, who's an academic, and is thrust into danger. So how does he deal with that? Uh, plus all the emotional baggage that went with it. Mm -hmm. When you're writing an, an historical fiction, are there any particular sort of themes or hallmarks that you think make this a David Gilman novel? Um, when, I, when I start, particularly with the medieval series, shall we say, we have reached a point at the end of every book where Thomas Blackstone uh, is in a certain situation and, and that book has ended. Then we pick up historically with the next book. So what I have to do is say, right, why is he, why is he in this situation? What is the situation? And that's very much my research. And I start off, I, I really don't know where this book is going, but I start off and I find that if I turn left instead of right, he bumps into history and history then takes him along. And so we're always just, just below the surface, if you like. You know, we've got this, we've got, a, we've got readers who, who know their history, who, who look at history and often will make a comment did that really happen in that time? Well, yes, it did, mostly. So I always have to take Blackstone with me. It's the emotional content of Blackstone because he's vulnerable. And it's that vulnerability with all my characters, particularly with, say, Night Flight to Paris, where I've taken the older man. Uh, his family is under threat. He is being asked to go from his desk, where he's a code breaker, into occupied France and face enormous terror fear and, and it, it's that twist on the emotion that, that really interests me and it doesn't matter what characters there are in the book they all have to have that vulnerability and they all have to have that desire to stay alive so if I've got Thomas Blackstone and his men Sir Gilbert Kilbert and all the others the archers the bowmen the fighters they all have the desire to sort of get through what they've got to get through, and that drives you know, it's it's a passion within the writing. I think. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that that's always been a feature of your historical fiction as well. Is um, is this realism of people doing what they have to do to survive? Um, I've always, uh, you know, when we look at Blackstone, Blackstone sometimes is forced to act in such a way that you would say this is unbridled savagery. And the same and, uh, at points in Night Flight, you know, for Harry, he's going to he's going to face some pretty tough decisions, yeah. the kind of decisions that we perhaps wouldn't be have to make, you know, um, uh, in a world of peace and prosperity, you know, like we might have um, experienced at the moment. Well, I don't think any of us can really imagine what it was like. I mean, I, uh, the Second World War is still living history, and obviously 500 years before it isn't. But I hope that what comes out of the books is the sense of you being there because the descriptive passages and the emotional content of those characters should, I hope, hold you there within those stories. And when you think he wouldn't do that and he does, or somebody does something against type, as it were, 
that's my interest. I, I just don't want anybody to be seen as straightforward A to B. They've got to go around these corners, they've got to see what's around there, and they react accordingly, as you say. And sometimes they think, well, what, what would you really do that? And of course you do, because we're talking about survival. Mm -hmm. And survival, at the end of the day, is such a basic instinct in us all. But I mean, you sort of, you know, when it comes to um, uh, uh, SOE agents um, jumping out of aeroplanes um, in parachutes, you, you have some um, you have some form uh, in uh, uh, in that world, mm -hmm. don't you? Well, of course, when I put Harry Mitchell into a Halifax bomber and he has to parachute out of it, it, it was not difficult for me to think of him inside a Hercules aircraft having to jump out of it because it, it is such a it's such an intense experience that once you go into that slipstream and of course what happens to Harry Mitchell thank God did not happen to me uh, so yes one recalls that very easily that that's not too difficult and hopefully in those descriptive passages passages you, you get the feel for what it was like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so is the writing experience um, uh, of doing a living memory historical novel different from <clears throat> constructing um, something about times long, long past, 500 years in the past? I think it's a case of me describing in the books what I see in my head. That's basically mm -hmm. what I'm doing. Yeah. I see the imagery and I want you to share that imagery and I want you to share those emotions. So if I'm saying, right, if I am that character and I am doing this, or created this thing, how do we go about it? There's the one thing that does link in is if you've been frightened enough in your life, it's easy to put that onto the well, you put that onto the page. And you can draw, you're, you're drawing on things probably you've long forgotten. And I think they do surface, they do, they do bubble up. Mm -hmm. And as I say, being scared is something I can yeah. I have a strong memory yes. of. <laughs> you suddenly put your characters through the ringer, as it were. You, there's no holds barred. When it comes to, I think, sort of brutality um, and uh, and cruelty, um, is that something that you like to do to keep your readers guessing? You know, I never. I, I hope. Uh, I try very hard not to have just gratuitous violence. I, I just don't want to start hacking your legs off just for the sake of doing it. When we're in these situations, in in those very violent times. Uh, the brutality was, 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 was incredible. I, su I suppose in a way, you know, you can look at contemporary life in certain parts of the world and it's, it's probably even more brutal. Mm. So I, I don't particularly enjoy doing it, no. And I know that in my book, from some of my readers, that they write to me and they say, God, how could you kill that character? How could you kill... Well, if you think of a period of, say, 15, 20 years that we're, we're, we're talking about, of fighting all the time, people are going to die. They're going to have to die of disease, wounds, and they're going to die in action. So some of those characters have to die. And I often find when I'm writing the book, thinking, hang on, is anybody going to die in this book? And if so, who? And through the story, certain turns are made and events created where you have to put that character into that situation. Now, is he going to survive? Maybe he does. Maybe. It's interesting that you say you wonder who you are going to kill off if you are. My usual feeling is who is actually going to survive. Yeah. Well, because I, I think it seems to me that you, you've tried to kill Thomas off a couple of times. Well, maybe and he's badly wounded, wounded don't hand. forget. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he gets badly wounded. And when he's wounded, he has to have time to recover. I, I, I don't really like this idea of you you get an arrow through the chest and then you're up and running the next mm -hmm. page. So yeah. I, I like to try and yeah. get that. Well, I, I think that that's the real hallmark, actually, of, 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 of Gilman's um, fiction, historical fiction, you know, apart from the unrelenting brutality of, uh, of life in uh, medieval um, France or occupied France, um, is the fact that I feel that you're there every step of the way um, with your characters. There's a very procedural element to it. When Thomas has to go and do something, um, he doesn't just get on his horse and ride for three days and suddenly at the next scene where something happens, 
you take us through the forests, mm -hmm. you make us ford the rivers, you, t you know, we experience the weather, we experience what it's like to have to scoop out, you know, or um, at altitude, you know, or try to cross the Alps at the wrong time of year. Um, and I think that that, you know, the fact that, you know, you are there every step of the way with the characters is something that I feel, you know, is, is very much, you know, your, your calling card and what I, what I enjoy most about, um, about your novels. So that the landscape seems to me to be something that, that interests you. The, yeah, absolutely. The landscape is a character. It, it really is. Where you are is, plays an important role in, in, in the book. So as you say, you're going across the Alps in winter, and they did, of course, more than we could do now, probably. Uh, it, 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 you've got to get it across, just how difficult it is. Or if it's, I mean, I know I've slept in many a a dank forest and a dirty hole and what have you, and that's easy to put across the dirt under the fingernails, it's, it's very easy to express. Mm -hmm. But the, the weather itself, uh, the landscape, the towns, they are characters. They, it has to oppress you or open up or take you a place. Uh, that's part of the journey. It's part of the character's journey as well. And it certainly has an influence on the story, where we are, what's happening. Yeah, indeed. And I mean, most uh, extraordinarily um, was... Uh, the incredible storm, um, which was true. Yeah, that was accurate. I didn't make that up. That defeated uh, that defeated Edward's army. Mm -hmm. He was at the walls of Paris, uh, and they, they came to bring. They turned around. They were heading for Chartres, and this storm came across the plain, and it killed a thousand horses and, and men. And luckily, Blackstone survived by getting his men into a barn in a nearby village. But that, that's, that's very strong. It's, it's, I think it was called, if I'm not mistaken, it was called Black Monday. Black Monday, yes. Black Monday, yeah. yes. Uh, so so that, that really, it was nice to get to, to grips with that. But of course, it, it, it's got to be put across that uh, it's danger to our people that we care about. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it's also, you know, it's an example, isn't it, of the wonderful things, you know, as a historical um, uh, fiction writer, that you can discover that are actually real. Absolutely. Because, I mean, you... It's a cliche to say, but you couldn't make that up. You know, someone would say if you've just invented a hailstorm that killed a thousand people, it, it didn't happen. It doesn't. There'll be somebody who knows. He's read the book. He's read the historical facts. Yeah. No, it's, so it's it's good to bring that in. And as I say, wherever we, wherever possible, every single thing that reflects well on our story historically, that's what you bring in. I mean, uh, even the character, shall we say, uh, the Dauphin. King's son. Okay. He was ill. He wasn't a well man. Uh, some say he had been poisoned. I think I might have even mentioned that in, in one of the books. His hair was falling out. He dribbled, his nose dribbled all the time. And I thought there was, there was one scene in, uh, I think it was the last, in the last book, uh, where the king has been released. Okay, he's back in Paris. He's back in the palace. And his son is there. And his son is sniffing doing this all the time. Well, if you've got a child that's forever sniffing and snorting, you can get really irritating, can't it? So the king gets irritated because of that. But then we show the intelligence of the sun. So we go beyond the physical. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that's what I'm always trying to unfurl, uncover, is, is what lies within. It's what lies within of every character that's really important. Otherwise you say, well, get on your horse and ride. But that's not what I'm interested in writing. So David, you have five books in the Master of War series. Mm -hmm. I believe there are more coming. Apparently. Yes, I'm writing the, I'm writing the six now. Mm -hmm. And Night Flight to Paris is a standalone. Uh, yeah. And you have also, as a standalone, you've uh, been to South Africa um, with um, The Last Horseman. Yes, yeah. Um, what's the difference in your mind? Is it a change of pace of scene, scenery that you need um, every now and again to sort of refresh you know, one's uh, creative batteries? Is this, you know, or is it just a great idea that springs into your mind that you just have to actually write? It's more the latter than the former. Uh, the idea is, the idea entices me. There's, there's something that just entices me about it. And so you think, well, I, I'd like to write about that. And, and that's the start of the process. With The Last Horseman, uh, as you know, I spent seven years in South Africa. I was working in publishing over there many years ago before I started writing full time. And I was always very aware of what went on there in the, in the past, which is also fairly recent history. You know, 
1890s, 1900s. And there was one story I thought was worth telling, um, and, and that was, I wanted to start it not in South Africa. I started in Dublin. And so we actually picked up on, on some of the old troubles that were there with an American lawyer, <clears throat> again, a man who had experienced war, uh, who never ever wanted to see war again. So in many respects, he was a, not a pacifist, but having experienced the horror of it, he said, never, ever again. And of course, what do I do to him? I send him off to a major conflict. Uh, so he has, to, he has to deal with that as well. So, so the, these are the little triggers that get you going. And you might make a note and write to him back to it. And then it's finding the time. Because trying to write a standalone novel when we work basically nine months a year anyway on each Master of War book, then there's the editing process, the rewriting that one has to tinker with. You then have to try and slot in the standalone. So I really need to write this book. I really want to write this book because if you don't have that passion or that desire to get stuck in and and and, and work longer hours still, <clears throat> it's not worth it. It's not worth doing. Mm -hmm. So what's next for Thomas Blackstone? Oh, I can't tell. Just a hint. No, because I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, David, for taking the time to come and talk to us. Um, uh, I guess we ought to go now and uh, meet some booksellers. That's a good idea. Thank you.